We've never seen anything like this in our lives. We love because he first loved us. The Lord doesn't have his rightful place in our life. He's having a daily quiet time. Well, hello and welcome. We're glad that you could join us for this 2020 men's retreat. It's a virtual men's retreat. Our speaker is Larry Price. Uh, Due to the global pandemic, uh, COVID-19, Larry is doing two messages for us for our men's retreat via Zoom. Larry was actually saved out of a pretty rough background back in the late 1970s. His testimony was actually broadcast on uh, Unshackled, which some of you may have heard. In the early 80s, Larry transitioned to full-time service in the Lord's work down in the Florida area, where he has been working for several years in Christian radio in the mid-80s. He served also uh, for several years as a camp director at Camp Horizon in Florida. In 2000, he was uh, additionally commended to the work of the Lord by Hiwasa Bible Chapel in the Orlando, Florida. Larry is going to be speaking to us today uh, in two messages, uh, followed by a wrap-up message as well uh, from the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, the title of his uh, overall series is A Special Dedication for Unique Times. So please listen in, and uh, as we begin to already hear the message in progress from Larry. When you come to the book of First and Second Samuel, as they're titled in our English Bible, uh, they're titled differently in the Hebrew Bible, and they would actually be the first, this would be the first book of the Kings. And that's sort of appropriate because this book is, uh, is a, a segue, if you will, uh, from the period when the judges lived and ruled uh, unto the beginning of the monarchy in, uh, in Israel's first kings. Um, and so it actually takes us back all the way to connect us with the book of Judges. And I'll just read the last verse of Judges chapter 21, because there's an expression there that's found four times in this last chapter. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then, you know, the book that follows that small portrait book, if you will, of Ruth that comes after that, but it's still within that time frame of the transition from the time of Judges leading up to the time of the monarchy in Israel. And the last chapter of Ruth in the last verse ends with the word David, which is an appropriate introduction to what the Hebrews would call the first book of Kings or the first book of Samuel. That period of time when every man did that which was right in his own eyes and there was no king in Israel. It was a time of failure. Um, and much that was out of order. As I was saying, in the book of Judges, what began with the first judge continues to deteriorate to the time you get to the last major judge, who was Samson, who, although he accomplished some things, you had the deliverer who wasn't able to deliver himself, ultimately. So that's the, the time frame in which we find ourselves. And as you begin to look into this book of First Samuel, You find that it begins in the very first chapter with Elkanah, who had two wives, and he was a worshiper. He went to worship and to sacrifice uh, unto the Lord at the the Lord of hosts when the tabernacle was then in Shiloh. But it kind of clues us in from the beginning, because although bigamy was not roundly condemned at this stage of Israel's history, whenever you got two wives, folks, and I know this is a men's meeting, you got problems, you know. Most of us have our hands full with one wife. And so you got two wives who are contentious, uh, and there's uh, animosity between them. So here's a man who was a worshiper, but in a sense, his own house was out of order. And then you've got Eli, who was a priest, and as we'll see, his house was out of order. And then you've got Eli's sons, and you want to talk about out of order. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. You got priests serving at the tabernacle who are called sons of Belial, and they didn't know the Lord. 
So that's out of order. And then you've got this really strange thing that goes on. I've spent a lot of time on this one, and I've not been able to fully get to the bottom of it, except to say in chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14, you've got this strange procedure where it says that the priest's customs with the people was, if someone offered a sacrifice, the servant came while the flesh was boiling, and he stuck in this three-pronged hook, and whatever he pulled out of the pot or the pan or the kettle, uh, the priest took for himself. Now, I find nowhere in the book of Leviticus and the prescriptions and the regulations given for the sacrifices where there was even supposed to be a boiled sacrifice other than one or two instances that had to do with the Nazarite and one mention of a boiled shoulder. But it just seems like that too's out of order. And then to worsen it, whatever their custom was, Eli's sons came and said, give me the flesh to roast. And they said, well, don't fail to burn the fat. And they said, you give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So things were out of order at the house of the Lord. And then you read this little phrase that's found in chapter three about when Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. And when he went to lay down in his place, it says, verse three, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. Well, the lamp of God was never to go out in the temple of the Lord. It was to be kept burning continually. And it, it shows a laxity among the priesthood in that day because God said that that lampstand was to be continually fed and continually burning as long as the tabernacle was set up. And then what we're going to look at ultimately is a situation that happens in chapter 4 where the ark of God was taken, and that'll take you all the way to chapter 7, where you'll read in verse 2, it came to pass while the ark abode in kerjath Jerem that the time was long, for it was 20 years. So for 20 years, imagine the situation. You got the tabernacle set up at Shiloh, but you got the ark in a separate place for 20 years. How did they function in the tabernacle for those 20 years without the ark and everything that the ark implied? And so with that in mind, I want to take us back to uh, chapter 4. Israel had gone out against the Philistines to battle, and they pitched beside a place called Ebenezer. At least that's what it became known as. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek, and the Israelites were defeated. The Philistines slew of the army about 4,000 men. And when the people came into the camp, in verse 3, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Well, it never was an it, was it? And so one question that we ask, how did they get in to get the ark anyway? It seems that perhaps God's presence had already left that place. But they, they had developed into this it mentality, which was very dangerous. And so if we stop for a moment and we think about the ark and what it represented, Israel was unique among all the nations. Uh, one of the things that the nations around referred to Israel as, as their temple or their tabernacle was the imageless temple because they had no idolatrous image to bow down to or worship. But what made Israel unique as a nation was not that they were bigger than anybody else, not that they were badder than anybody else. What made them unique was God's presence dwelling in the midst of that people. That was the spiritual heartbeat of that nation. And so by the time you get down to uh, chapter 4, they had gone and lost the ark. When they lost the ark, their religion was just an empty shell, in a sense. It wasn't any different than the heathen nations around them when they lost the ark. The moment they had reduced God to an it. See, the ark was not some magic talisman, some good luck charm that you just pulled out of a box to come and help you in a time of need. Beware of the God in a box mentality. What do I mean by that? 
The scriptures are replete with references that tell us that God is a God who delights to save. Matter of fact, the very book of Judges, that's one of the themes, isn't it? God was pleased to raise up deliverers because God delights to save his people. But do we think that God is just like in a box that we can pull out whenever we want to, to get him to come and meet whatever situation we have? What was the ultimate goal of Israel's redemption? All the way back in Exodus 19, the Lord said, I brought you out on eagle's wings to bring you unto myself. That was the goal of Israel's redemption. It wasn't just to go down into a land of milk and honey and all of those good things without the Lord being there. The presence of the Lord. And so we have to be careful, men, that we don't lose the sense of a vital living relationship where the living God, that he's not just something we pull out of a box to help us in some extremity or some time of situation. But I want you to think about this and just get this in your mind for a moment to think about it. The ark was lost among the Philistines. The ark was lost to the Gentiles. Just think about that for a moment. And then you hear the remarkable story of what happened in chapter 5. They brought it like a trophy, the Philistines did, uh, down uh, to their to their temple, their house of their God, Dagon. And you remember they went in and set it up and they came back in the morning and, and, and their statue of Dagon had fallen down on his face. This is always an interesting question. What do you do when your God falls down? Well, you go back in and stand him up. Listen, this is going to go to something that my brother from Jacksonville asked about David when he re- carries the ark in 2 Samuel. Listen, if you got to help God out or stand him up, you better find another God. He doesn't need your help to be propped up or stood up. And so that's another story for another day. But you remember then what happens is that they this judgment came upon the, uh, the Philistines. And apparently... As we read later in chapter 6, that it said in verse 5 of chapter 6 that they made images of mice. It could have been a mice-born plague that happened to the Philistines. Some of us remember a few years ago at Yosemite when there was a like a bubonic plague. Uh, it killed several people. All came from mice. I think it was in Curry Village at the time. But anyway, um, this plague happens upon the Israelites, and they, they begin to think, well, what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's share the love. So they send the ark to the other chief of the Philistine cities, you see. Here we've got a present for you, you see. And as they share that, you know, so they didn't practice proper social distancing, all right? And so they sent the ark around to the other places. And, um, and, and when it got there, Probably didn't even wash their hands, you know. And, and so next thing you know, the ark's going from one chief Philistine city to the other and one chief Philistine to the other, and every one of them's getting smitten. And the King James puts it in a rather delicate way. They were smitten with emrods in their secret parts. Now, the Philistines, one of the characteristics of the Philistines, and it'll come out later in this book, pardon the pun, in a very big way. The Philistines put their stock, that is, they look to what raw power and brute force could do. And the bigger the champion, well, give us a Goliath, you see. That's where we'll put our confidence. What do you do if you're God and you want to show people that their confidence placed wherever it might be in a big man or in what big men could produce or what raw power could do, what do you do? Do you bring out a bigger man? That's not what God has to do. He'll take something so small you can't even see it, and he'll put it in a very humbling place 
for these men. And the next thing you know, you have not a pandemic, but you've got an epidemic taking place throughout all the land of the Philistines. An epidemic that brought down these people who trusted in big men with something so small they couldn't even see it. Some form of virus that caused a tumor or whatever it did. Interesting, isn't it, to think about? So what do you do if you've got an epidemic? Well, you get a task force, don't you? That's what the Philistines did. I don't know what they called it, the, the hemorrhoidal uh, plague task force, you see, whatever it was. They got all their experts together, all their technicians, and their scientists in chapter six. And they proposed an experiment. And of course, it's amazing to look in chapter six. I do want to read that a uh, few verses there because uh, to see the knowledge that had spread to the Philistines of the testimony of God. In verse three of chapter six, they said, listen, if you send the ark of God away, don't send it away empty. Return him a trespass offering. They had a knowledge of sin. And later on, when they talk about the trespass offering, they had a knowledge that sin required some form of payment. Now, as perverted as their thinking may have been, they knew that. Then they said, don't harden your hearts, in verse 6, like the Egyptians did and like Pharaoh did. God had sent that testimony of what had happened to Pharaoh and Egypt far and wide. And so they proposed this experiment. And they said, here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to make images of the tumors and of the mice. And then we're going to take a new cart. This is chapter 6 and verse 7. Because if you're going to have an, an, an experiment, you've got to have a clean control, you see. So we're going to take a brand new cart. And then we're going to stack the odds. We're going to take two milk cows that are still in milk and that have calves, and we're gonna hook them to the carts. And these are gonna be cows that have never had a yoke on them. They've never pulled a wagon. So they're, they're, they're stacking the odds, stacking the odds. And then we're gonna send them away to go in the opposite direction while their calves are placed back here at home. And then we're gonna know whether this thing was just a chance, or if indeed this is the hand of God. Now, what would God do? Would God look down at those Philistines and say, stupid people, I'm not playing your silly game. I don't have to show you anything. Not at all. You see, whatever other purposes we're here to have to do with the nation of Israel, God was giving a witness and a testimony to those Gentiles for the purpose of showing them who was indeed the true and the living God. There's a cross reference in Psalm 78 that says this in verse 59. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. Was the ark of God taken? Well, yes. But it was God giving his strength over into the hands of those Gentiles and his glory into the enemy's hand to prove who was the true and the living God. And let your mind fast forward, if you like, to the scene that took place on Calvary when the strength of God and the glory of God in the person of the Son of God was allowed to be taken and given over into the hands of the Gentiles. 
not only the hand of the Gentiles, but even to the power of darkness at that time. This is your hour, the Lord said. And why? To prove who is indeed. I want to tell you, there's no greater evidence of who the true and the living God is. He's the God who would give his son for you. The God who would give his son for me. God demonstrated his love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The glory of God given over. And so they devised their experiment. And they sent the cows on their way. And the scripture says in verse 10 of chapter 6, they shut the calves up at home. And they laid the ark of God upon the cart. And the cows took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh. And they went along the highway, lowing as they went. Turn not aside to the right or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them. And they saw and they watched what happened. There were those calves back at home. Was there a power, a force, that could cause one to go against natural instinct, against your own nature in a sense? Everything in those cows would want to turn and go back to their calves as they went lowing down the road. But there was an invisible power that could cause even those calves to go against nature and to subject themselves to a power that was higher, to achieve a higher purpose and a higher goal. They were only brute beasts. And yet, what a privilege those cows had with that cart, carrying the ark, that place where God had chosen to seat himself among the children of Israel initially, but to make himself known to those Philistines and to prove the reality of who he is. In our next session together, we want to begin to think about that power, if you will. And we want to go back and look at that which is found in this book that presents to us such unique dedication uh, in a very difficult time in the history of the nation. And we want to think about that and examine and apply it even in our own hearts and lives. We're going to carry on and listen to lecture number two from our virtual men's retreat as Larry Price continues to speak on the overall topic of special dedication for unique times. We hope you find these encouraging as they were to us as well. In chapter four with the Israelites, when they went to get the ark, one of the things that is uh, going to repeat itself throughout this book of first Samuel and even on the second Samuel is wrong solutions to real problems, good intentions in a sense, but not the answer. There's no question that among the Israelites there had been failure. 4,000 of their men had died. But what they proposed as a solution, we have to be careful of that in life in general, or not only individually, but collectively as well, in our meetings of believers, that we don't put forth wrong solutions, even when there is real and evident failure among us. So now getting back a bit, I want to back up and look, if we could, into chapter one. And I'm going to just do a brief scan that'll take us uh, probably to chapter six again to pick up one of the motifs or one of the themes that's woven throughout uh, this section of First Samuel. You remember the story of Hannah, and you remember the story of what it was that Hannah wanted more than anything else in the world. She wanted a son, and ultimately God gave her a son. And then she took that son, and when he was weaned, she gave that son back to the Lord and really gave him over to the Lord. And this is the first time in this book of 1 Samuel, where we find 
what, what I call going against nature or rising above your own personal interests. In other words, the thing that she wanted more than anything in life, the thing that she poured out her soul to God for was to give her a son. Then she took that son. Now, you talk about a woman of remarkable faith. Everybody knew what was going on at the tabernacle. Everybody knew about Eli's sons, but she trusted the Lord. That's an encouragement to me, too, to folks still today. Sometimes I hear young couples say, well, I don't know whether we ought to have children. I don't know whether we can bring them into a world like this. Let me tell you, God is able to save. God is able to preserve. He did it with Samuel. He did it in that day. He still does it in the day and age in which we're living. Now, over against Hannah, who did that which was against her own personal interest, you have contrasted those sons of Eli. And we remember that it was said of them that they, instead of serving the Lord's interest, remember the people would come with the sacrifice in chapter 2 and verse 16 and say, Don't fail to burn the fat. That's the Lord's portion. And they said, you'll either give it to me or we'll take it by force. Those priests, Hophni and and Phinehas, they were consumed with their own personal interest. What served them, not with the Lord's interest. And even Eli in chapter 2 and verse 29, the rebuke to him was, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded? You honor your sons above me. In other words, the Lord's saying, you're more concerned, Eli, with your own personal interest with your sons. You're more concerned with their honor, honoring them, than you are me. What a contrast. And then look, if you would, in chapter 4. And this takes place at the end of the chapter, after the ark uh, is taken. And you can read repeatedly in this chapter about the ark being taken, how many times it's mentioned. And in verse 11, the ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And so somebody came to report the news. You get down to the end of the chapter in verse 19, and it says that Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel. The ark of God is taken. (laughs) Here's this woman, more concerned with the glory of God and the ark being taken than she is even the birth of her own son than she is of the death of her father-in-law, than she is of the death of her own husband, a woman whose primary concern was God's glory, not her own personal interest. And then finally for now, we remember in chapter 6, the story of the cows who did that which was contrary to nature. Cows that were not used to a yoke, that were sent down an unfamiliar road, that had no driver to the wagon, that went against their own natural instinct for home and for the calves who were there because these cows were still in milk. The love for their own calves was something they went against that which was natural to them. 
It's interesting, by the way, I won't get into the to the weeds too far, except to say that one of the problems in in this whole book that eventually comes out in a big way, it has to do with sons. And if you want to have an interesting study, you can go through first and second Samuel and think about sons, bad sons, the problem of sons. Hophni and e and Phineas, Eli's sons, Samuel's sons, and on and on it goes, the subject of sons. But that's that's another story. Except I mention it to say that apparently the word in the Hebrew for these calves is sons. It's interesting, too, that there are three sets of females given to us here. We have Hannah, we have Phineas's wife. And we got the cows, they were females, and how all of them reacted against that which was their own personal interest and in nature, moved by something else. So with that in mind, we back up now to the beginning, to this remarkable woman, Hannah, when we talk about unique times and special dedication. You see, one of the problems that I know that I have, and perhaps you have, and it goes back to something we were chatting about a little bit, it has to do with rote and routine. I don't know personally most of you men, but I would assume under normal circumstances, most of you work some form of job. You probably do fairly routine things from day to day. Life in general may be routine. And it probably couldn't have been any more so for anybody uh, or any, any more routine for somebody like Hannah who lived in the day in which she lived. We won't have time to get into it today, but her remarkable prayer that begins in chapter two, where she sees in her daily experience the very principles by which God will one day judge the, the world in which we live. It's remarkable the, the heights that her prayer rises to. In her daily domestic affairs, the very principle and recognition of God's government and grace, and that the ultimate solution will be found in the one who is called in chapter 2 and verse 10, his anointed which most of you would probably know, means his Messiah. There's the ultimate answer, Hannah says, to the problem of inequality, inequity, wrong in the world, and so on. God's government. It rises out of how she experiences God and what she learns through her daily routine experience and her daily routine struggles she sees God at work and sees higher principles. One that's so remarkable in chapter 2 and verse 8 says this, He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifts the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes, to make them inherit the throne of glory. <laughs> and in my Bible, I have a little note written beside that, an arrow that says, That's me. And if you're a believer in Christ, that's you. He's taken you from the lowest place to one day inherit the very throne of glory. God has a big program. And all of this, as I say, rises out of Hannah's uh, uh, daily domestic affairs and seeing how God was at work in her life. It's remarkable, isn't it, when we think of it like that? Hannah wanted a child and said, if I get that child, I will dedicate him to the Lord. And even though Hannah's life for many years was unfulfilled, she, she didn't have the thing that she really wanted in life. It didn't stop her from dedicating herself to the Lord. It didn't stop her from praying and pouring out her heart to the Lord. She was loyal to the Lord, even without her deepest 
desire in life being fulfilled. Talk about dedication. And that woman put the Lord's interest above her own. As we said in chapter one, when she took that little child and lent him, as it says, to the Lord. Amazing, isn't it? Here was a woman who in one sense had nothing. And then she gave everything she she desired against her own personal wishes. Men, when it comes down to it, you and I are often faced with choices in life. Now, God is not an ogre, and God is not a tyrant, and he doesn't demand more of us than we have. But at certain phases in life, we do have to face, don't we, that if we're going to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that may be, even like Hannah in her daily house life, if we're going to serve the Lord, it's going to require at some level the putting aside of our own personal interest, that the Lord's interest might be first. She recognized God's government in her, in her daily affairs. It's the overwhelming power, isn't it, of redemption. Let's go back to those those cows again. You know, when those cows in chapter six bore that ark, I don't want to get too far out here except to say this. Those brute beasts that were bearing the ark, the glory of God, as Psalm 78 reminds us, which had been given over into the hand of the Philistines. Bearing the ark of testimony, giving up their sons, and ultimately those cows' lives sacrificed on an altar to bring the glory of God back to the Israelites. <laughs> what a story. You talk about a level of dedication, if you will. <laughs> oh, to trade places with the cows, to be able to bear the glory of God, the testimony of the Lord in the world in which we live. And I want to fast forward now to chapter 7, because 20 long years go by. But what takes place now in verse 2? came to pass in chapter 7, verse 2, that while the ark abode in kerjath Jerem, that the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. What a change had come about. What change? <laughs> they weren't longing for it, were they? No, no, no. Now they lamented after the Lord, you see. Their desire was not now for an it. Samuel spoke to them. He said, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Serve him only. Four things that he said. In other words, you've got to mean business. If you really mean business, well, God will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, if you mean business, then be consistent with what that ark says, the message of that ark of the testimony. It was the ark of the covenant, wasn't it? And part of that covenant was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You will not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and so on. And do what that ark says and the message of what that ark means. And as they gather together, it says in verse 6, they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water, poured it out before the Lord, fasted on that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. They did mean business and they confessed their sin. And the children of Israel said to Samuel in verse eight, cease not to cry unto the Lord our God 
not that it, but that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. I tell you, this was serious business, wasn't it? You notice their, their confession in verse 6. We have sinned. You notice the seriousness. They, they poured that water out like a, like a drink offering to the Lord. And you notice what Samuel did. It was so special. It required something unique. He took a sucking lamb, one that was still at his mother's breast, and he offered that sucking lamb, that little baby lamb, holy unto the Lord. My mind goes back to that, those boys of Eli's who took of the offering of the Lord for themselves. Didn't give the Lord holy that which was his portion. And so throughout we see the special dedication that was required here for the unique time in which they found themselves to regain for them that presence of God in their midst and what would be required. Is there a power that is so powerful that even though we can't see it, it governs our lives more than the things that we do see. You know, my mind goes to the power of what motivates us. I think of Paul in the New Testament, and I believe the greatest motivation in that man's life is found in a verse that may be familiar to us. It's found in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And it's a very special verse to me. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I'm a simple man in many ways, and I want to tell you, if you talk about the secret of dedicating yourself to the Lord, and you break it down to its smallest possible component, I want to suggest to you it's found there in Galatians chapter 2 in just four words. Not I, but Christ. That will be yours and my greatest challenge every day of our life. Lord, help me live in such a way not I, but Christ. We've all got eye trouble, and I don't mean to kind of get you these one day if you don't already have them. I mean the big capital I, me. Not I, but Christ. Not a bad thing to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, help me to live this day in such a way. Not I, but Christ. And if you think that's difficult, well, uh, it's not only difficult, it's virtually impossible, except God has not left us to struggle through on our own. Because you see, that same verse tells us something, doesn't it? I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He's given me a power that I can rely upon that is above my own. And yet the motivation in that verse to Paul, a man, when sometimes I read what he experienced in life and what he suffered to serve the Lord, I, I, I look and I read the, those catalogs of all the things he suffered at times. And I think, why would a man like that ever get out of bed? And it's found in that verse, isn't it? The Son of God loved me. And he gave himself for me. I want to tell you, there's no greater motivation. No guilt trip will do it. No rules and regulations will do it. Like when you and I get hold or it gets hold of us, that great truth. 
Now, I want to, I know we're on a gallery view and that's fine, but I'm going to tell you that this verse, I'm going to use it for me, okay? The Son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. And nobody knows me like he knows me. And nobody knows what I was in my sin and my filth and my defilement and my rebellion and my waywardness and my debauchery. And yet the Son of God loved me. And he gave, he gave himself for me. And I'll tell you, like we say down here in our neck of the woods sometimes, if that don't light your fire, your wood must be wet. If that doesn't move you, I've got nothing else. <laughs> that is the greatest motivation, isn't it? And I find this balance in scripture, which is, is again, it, it, it's, it's unique this balance in scripture. There is a sense in which I have to come and you have to come. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're not a believer in Christ, you need to be saved. That's the, that's what you need to hear today above anything else I can say. If you've never come to Christ and trusted him as savior. That's what you need to know right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there's a sense in which we have to come to that which Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. You are not your own. I am not my own. God has a claim on my life. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are the Lord's. And the quicker we come to that realization, from time to time, we have to revisit it, don't we? It's not all about my interest and what I want. I'm not my own. I've been purchased. I am the Lord's. And the quicker we come to that realization, the better off we'll be. But over against that is the balance, isn't there? where Paul will come to us in Romans chapter 12 and say, I plead with you, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. By the mercies of God, he makes an appeal. Yes, God has a claim on my life. No, I'm not my own. But on the other hand, I must come and yield myself to him, to dedicate myself to him. And he doesn't require of me what happened with the cows. He doesn't require that I die for him necessarily. He requires that I live for him, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And the translators struggle in Romans 12, to communicate how that, that phrase should be, reasonable service, your true spiritual worship, your true priestly duty, if you will. And so the balance there that's found, but the motivating factor that'll move us, that unseen force, to go against our own personal desires and personal nature of things that we want just in life and things that we see in the world that govern and control us, something higher, something greater. God, the Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Larry. Yeah, any closing thoughts here for us? We're going to go back to chapter 7 for just a moment in uh, 1 Samuel. For 20 years, and then it finally says, all Israel lamented after the Lord. So whatever 
else was accomplished through this time, 20 years is a long time, it produced this longing for the Lord himself. Whoever thought, I mean, one of the words that keeps coming up quite regularly nowadays is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this in our lives. Whoever thought in the United States of America that people would be not able to find food on the shelves, that um, governments would pass edicts not allowing churches to meet and gather or people to gather for all kinds of reasons. It's unprecedented, isn't it? I do think that one good thing that will come out of this, I really believe this, is that it is causing us to long again for that day when we can actually meet together. There's no substitute for human interaction and to physically be able to come together in social interaction, but also as local churches to come together and to long to be together again. It'll, if it produces, as it's been said, you know, sometimes you don't appreciate things until you don't have them anymore. They're taken away. And if it produces us valuing even more the something that perhaps we took for granted, the ability to come together as believers the ability of families to come together and see one another. You know, all of these things that we took for granted on a daily basis, overnight almost, as if you threw a switch. You folks, even worse than most places, I think you were the one of the first areas, most of you in California there, that uh, got the, the shutdown or shut-in order. So hopefully that is one of the byproducts of this. But going back again to Chapter 7, when they confessed their sin, when they exemplified their dedication by pouring that water out, water was a precious commodity in that land. When they took a unique sacrifice, a sucking lamb, and offered that wholly to the Lord. We read in chapter seven and verse 10, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto, hath the Lord helped us. The Lord is our help. And it's amazing to see, isn't it? Because this was the place that was a place of shame and defeat before. But that place of shame and defeat was now a memorial of God's mighty deliverance. And on a personal level, may the Lord take, take those things in my life maybe things that are shameful, maybe things of defeat, and turn them into an evidence of his mighty deliverance. That was a place, you see, where they would, in a sense, say, never forget. Never forget what happened there, that Ebenezer. Never forget the defeat but never forget what God was able to turn it to that day. The day the Lord thundered. And I'll tell you, my mind fast forwards to the New Testament, to another place of shame that became a memorial of God's mighty deliverance. And that's the place called Calvary in the scripture. Where the sun was darkened that day and veiled the scene on Calvary's cross. And what looked like it was a place of defeat and what was a place of shame was the place of God's mighty deliverance. 
never forget. Go back and visit it. We do that, don't we, collectively when we come together on the first day of the week. We always come back to that place, don't we? You know, I've only been to the land of Israel one time, and there were a number of things that struck me in a very unique way. It wasn't always just the historical sites. But I'll never forget when we came to the garden tomb, some sort of society that runs that part of the place there. And uh, there was an Englishman there, and he came out to give us a little talk before we went into the garden. And he said something that struck me. I've never forgotten it. He said, never forget, it's not the place, it's the person. It's not the place. It's the person. Now, I trust that you know when I say Calvary that I do not disassociate that from the person of the Lord Jesus. And we never forget what he endured there for us. I'd like to just read, if I could, a, a couple of verses from the uh, hymns of worship and remembrance, or the black book as we sometimes call it. And it's 177. And it's, Savior, we remember thee. Savior, we remember thee. Thy deep woe and agony. All thy suffering on the tree. Savior, we adore thee. Calvary, O oh Calvary. Mercy's vast, unfathomed sea. Love eternal, love to me. Savior, we adore thee. Darkness hung around thy head. When for sin thy blood was shed, victim in the sinner's stead, Savior, we adore thee. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And like with them, to go back in that sense, to never forget, never forget Calvary, but never forget the person and what he did there for us, and the freshness of that, not only as we come together collectively as believers, but in our individual lives and experience. We are living in unique times and unprecedented times, and may God help us in this time to especially dedicate ourselves to him, to be used for his honor and glory in whatever capacity and whatever place that may be, and maybe it's like Hannah in our daily domestic affairs, wherever it may be. Never forget. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Larry. You know, I think that, um, you know, you've given us a, a lot to think about here. I really encourage uh, you guys to see what does the Lord have for you uh, from what was uh, said today. Now, what did you need to hear? Uh, interact with the Lord. Please seek his face. And I know that me personally, you know, when I saw Larry's title, uh, Special Dedication for, for Unique Times, my initial thought was, oh, I need to double down on and, and be focused. I don't think I was ready for the sacrifice aspect of it, to be reminded of my eye trouble and be reminded of... Uh, to give all uh, and to sort of look starkly at Hannah's example of sacrifice. So I'm praying uh, guys and men uh, that uh, we will follow uh, some of the, the, the examples that we've seen today and, and take those to heart. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for our time together. Uh, Lord, we are grateful uh, for your word and the, what was written here in the record of first Samuel for us. Lord, I pray for uh, us as men, Lord, in our all of our unique situations are around the, the country. Help us, Lord, to uh, be good examples of living wholeheartedly for you, examples of dedication and sacrifice and putting you first in all things. Lord, we uh, want to, to give all to you in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. <music>